Oh. Yeah, so as I say, I'm Judy and I work for ISEND and Katie is here also from SLES, uh, part of the Sussex County Council. So, so what I'm going to cover today is some of the signs, how you can tell um, how your children are doing really, um, we're spotting any decline in wellbeing and what you might be able to do to help. We're also going to talk a little bit about transition into school from early years settings, nurseries or, or elsewhere. And then we're going to talk about some practical tips and, and ways of supporting parents and carers and also staff emotional wellbeing because because staff obviously have had a very, very difficult time um, in the last year. So we're very um, conscious of that. And then just highlight some local provision um, that you can access for children and for adults. Um, so hopefully that will cover most of your uh, requirements. So just talking first of all about signs of distress in children, and you'll be well aware of these because you know the children in your settings. So this is just a list really of things. I'm, I'm not going to show all the videos, but I have got links on here of, of different videos um, that you can access. Um, but I'm just a bit nervous about my sound quality today. So um, the links will be there. We, I'll send you the slides so you can um, watch them. Um, but here's just a few different um, symptoms that you might notice. So if your children are not normally crying, but they are crying, um, or they're prone to crying, or, or they're very sort of easily upset, that's obviously a signal, and for adults as well, that something is not well. Um, any sort of agitated behaviour, unable to be still as well, um, is often a sign of, of underlying irritation or just not being settled um, psychologically as well as physically. So sleep difficulties are quite numerous, so they could be problems with getting to sleep. Fear of going to bed, fear of sleeping alone when a child's already been sleeping alone really happily for a long time. Um, trouble staying asleep and, and and nightmares, so night terrors, things like that. All of these things obviously are indications. Um, and I'm sure that most parents and carers will, will tell you about nightmares, but they may not always tell you about um, other sleep issues. So it's worth checking that just to get it, an overall picture. And often fear of being alone is, is quite um, something that comes to the fore when um, children are feeling very unsettled or anxious. And this may be that they're picking up on stress of the adults around them. Um, or, so, or something may have happened that's unnerved them. And, and we know from this past year that uh, many people who are normally very robust have been quite wobbly and, and felt themselves to become quite anxious. And we can probably all think of people in our personal networks as well as our professional networks who have really struggled in the last year with their well-being. So it's and that's transmitted to children, as you know. So any change is the main thing. Um, children acting in ways that, that, that is not normal for them are showing that they are um, having trouble with something. And the regressing, obviously, also. So that could be um, children having toileting issues when they haven't before, wanting to drink from a bottle talking like a much younger child, wanting to be a baby. It's kind of asking for protection. It's asking for care. So all of these things um, you, you will be noticing. And also I've, no, I've heard from many, many settings at all different age ranges about much more aggressive and irritable behaviour, even leading to fights in junior schools and secondary schools. Um, and that also can be a symptom of underlying anxiety. It's also to do with being pent up. So for, for many children and young people, that's, you know, they've been very restricted. Um, so it's a symptom of that, but it also can indicate uh, an underlying kind of lack of able to, being able to self-regulate. So all of those things. So the tips generally for supporting children's emotional development are to help children to talk about how they feel. So um, there are all sorts of ways of doing this and um, using uh, puppets or 
cuddly toys or figures or characters or comic strips can all help to illustrate how other people are feeling. And, and when children get to develop their vocabulary around feelings, then um, they can start to apply them to themselves. So there's, there's kind of different elements of this because there's noticing how other people are feeling and how would you know that? So it might be do some work on facial expressions. It might be also using words or actions or behaviours or body postures. But it's also helping children to understand how do they feel in their body? How do they know when they're feeling sad? What happens in their body? How do they know when they're feeling worried about something? They might get a churny tummy or a headache. So I'm using I messages. I feel sad because... Um, I can't go and see my friend or my dog's died or whatever it is. Um, helping children to articulate that verbally um, can help them to self-regulate and identify what those feelings are. And once those feelings have names, they are more manageable. So there's no such thing as a bad feeling. All feelings are feelings. They just are. All feelings are valid. Uh, but what's not always possible is to or safe or appropriate is to follow up those feelings in how we behave. So sometimes the, the behaviour can be inappropriate, but we need to validate those feelings. So saying things like, oh, I'm so sorry that your dog died. I imagine you're feeling very sad about that or imagine that you're feeling very upset. So using words like that um, helps just children to develop that vocabulary. And things that help to um, children to calm down is so we will look at the brain in a moment and think about ha what happens in the brain when we're upset in any way, whether it's heightened positive feelings or heightened negative feelings. Um, but in order to um, function cognitively, we need to first get to a state of calm. So that's a really important thing with children and any activities that you can do to help, whether that's teaching children to breathe deeply and to hold their breath and then exhale for longer than they've inhaled, or whether you teach them to um, do progressive muscle relaxation where you're tensing and clenching and then letting go. These things get children in tune with their bodies um, and then help them to know when they're tense and how to relax. And that's then a tool that they've always got to hand. Also yoga. So I know lots of settings do yoga exercises for children. There's some lovely things online where um, all the poses are related to animals and you can make them into stories. And that's just a very kind of great opportunity to do focused relaxation with children of any age. Um, and some children are doing mindfulness as well in different settings. Um, so even if you just have a quiet space or some calm music and you encourage children just to sit, it's just kind of resetting and calming down, finding a quiet space in the day. And encouraging positive self-talk. So I know how to calm down. I know how to take deep breaths. I know how to sit still and work out what I'm feeling. And you could have a class discussion. Uh, I'll talk to young children about what things they can do to help themselves feel better. So, and then just remind them of what those things were so that they can share with, with each other what they do. And um, then they can sometimes just suggest to each other, why don't you try going for a little walk outside or um, sitting in the cushion with Teddy? or putting a blanket around you, whatever it might be. So sharing these ideas openly with children and encouraging them to remember them and take charge of them can be really useful. Um, so looking at um, some of the more vulnerable children in your settings. So you, you probably know your families quite well. Um, so some of them may have ex be experiencing adverse childhood experiences, which is they're generally categorised in this way um, under the sort of abuse and neglect and fa complex family needs headings. So any of these issues around any type of abuse or neglect, severe mental illness or enduring um, health issues, having a relative in prison, um, or family breakdown, substance misuse, or the mother being treated 
violently or any kind of violence in the home. These all are counted as adverse childhood experiences and these are really difficult things for children to um, talk about. Uh, they may not even ever mention them, but you might uh, know about them or you might not. But the impact of these is, is quite um, long lasting or can be. Um, other things that come into the sort of trauma camp uh, of serious issues like this for the more vulnerable groups will include all the things listed on this slide. So any kind of um, situations that give rise to any prejudice of any kind um, or uh, perceptions of betrayal or perceptions of abandonment. So sometimes with family breakdown, children can feel that they've been left, even though actually it's partners that leave each other, children can feel uh, left and sometimes obviously they are. Um, bereavement, um, any type of instability or lots of frequent house moves and change for whatever reason, very unsettling and will impact on children's emotional well-being and on their behaviours. So it also has the potential to disrupt their attachment with their caregivers. So all of these things are going on. So there's a lot to look out for here. So you may notice in parent carer behaviours that, um, you know, they're very changeable as well and their ability to cope with different things uh, is something that you're having to manage. So uh, you probably have an idea of who, who those families are in your communities. So the impact on children of these things is um, sometimes be challenging behaviour or difficult behaviour. They may have self-worth, they may have very poor self-image and they may be quite clingy. Um, so they may not be getting their majority of needs met or different needs met in the home setting. So they will be looking to the adults in their um, early years settings for some of these um, issues. And so it's a lot to cover, but it's just that just to be aware of these issues and um, how you can help is by just providing that constant, calm, supportive environment. So that's where the staff wellbeing comes in, because obviously you need to be in a good place yourselves um, to be able to maintain this state of calm. And I was talking to um, a mental health lead earlier who was saying it's so tiring being this, this calm, professional, um, cognitively able, uh, rational, self-regulated person all day and feeling like you need to project and model this, which clearly you do in your roles. And actually, sometimes you need to um, get together with colleagues and be a human being um, in addition to being that professional person. So that's what we'll come on to in the staff wellbeing section. But it's just important to remember that there is vicarious trauma. So the impact of you dealing with all these situations is, is also um, you know, something to be aware of. So thinking about what happens in the brain. So we've got um, three parts to our brain. And when we are and when children are living in very stressful situations, or in situations in which they feel emotionally or physically unsafe, then their brain is flooded with cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And this actually shuts down the thinking brain, or it's called here the smart brain. So their cognitive functions will go offline. And what happens is they're being led by their survival and emotional brain. So the survival brain is the oldest part of the brain. It's the brain stem. And that's um, so that's what governs our um, fight or flight reset reflex. So children who are living in in really challenging circumstances at home will be easily triggered into their survival or emotional brains and so they may have short attention spans, concentration may be limited um, and they may be a high, on hyper arousal a lot of the time. So those may be the ones who run off, who are pacing, who are fidgety, who are, look a bit distracted or who are very tired as well because it's exhausting. Uh, living in this kind of situation. So and they may be the ones who um, show their behaviours to be 
very dysregulated and agitated. So it's just keeping an eye on on that, and that's that will um, be what's behind some of those behaviours. So the window of tolerance is really that kind of um, range that that we all have and that children need to develop as well. So there is a kind of optimal zone in the middle where a child is able to feel comfortable, they feel able to be alert and attend to what's going on around them in their settings with their peers, with their learning. And, uh, you know, they might not understand everything, they might not like everything, but they're able to tolerate, they're able to uh, withstand little changes or little fallouts with friends or things not going quite to plan. If you look uh, at the upper section in the hyperarousal, this is the bit we were talking about with trauma, where or a sudden change or something upsetting where children become overwhelmed and they don't know how to handle themselves. They might shut down, they might be crying, shouting, or they might go really quiet. Um, and they either want to get out of there or they will freeze. So this comes from our primitive um, responses to being in high risk situations. So clearly, though, that's not a good place to be. And it, it feels awful for the child. And it's very hard to witness. And that's where you will need to bring your child back to a state of calm. So um, the hypoarousal was the, was the opposite end where you're, you're freezing and a bit zoned out. So if you see sometimes those children who are just looking a bit like they're somewhere else, they might be. They might have gone somewhere else in their mind because they can't tolerate the here and now and, and they're frightened. So it won't necessarily be the situation they're in that's frightening, but it's what's going on in the background that's that's leading to feelings of being triggered. So um, what do we need to do for those children? So safety and routines are really important. So some children are living in very unpredictable um, family situations where the adults around them are dysregulated and not behaving in a predictable way. So we need to be um, entirely predictable as far as we can be. Um, so having routines, having set times of day where things happen, having lunch at the same time, having play at the same time, um, sitting in the same corner for stories, having um, a place in, in the classroom or in the setting, having a particular cushion, having a particular toy, those kind of things, um, those are really helpful. Um, because the brain otherwise expends a lot of energy on trying to work out what's happening next, trying to work out, am I safe here? What do I need to do? Do I need to get out of this situation or can I relax? So um, those types of things, really important. And I know we've talked previously with early years providers about um, how helpful it can be to have visual reminders and visual clues about what the routines are. So what's coming next? and having that in pictorial form really helpful. Giving choices where possible. So you may not need, uh, may not be able to do that as much with really young children, but giving little choices about, would you like to um, look at the green book or the red book? Would you like to look at this book or would you like to do some drawing? So those types of small choices um, can give children who live in um, slightly uncontrolled environments are feeling that they have some control. So, so that's important and that strengthens and stabilises a child. Um, increasing support. So I know that you have a system of key people in your settings um, and I think each child has a key person. So in schools and colleges, we talk about um, key people as well or emotionally available adults um, as check-in people. So sometimes children might go through a particularly wobbly time and they might need a bit more from that key person. They might need extra check-in time or extra one-to-one -one time. So if you start to notice some of those changes we mentioned earlier on, it might be that there's something else going on, there's something you don't know about, and it might be helpful for that child just to have a little bit more personal attention. 
So having limits and the child knowing what the consequences are of any inappropriate behaviour, I think it's something you're all doing, but just re-communicating that at frequent intervals. Um, so the other thing that's affected by really difficult social or family circumstances and any traumatic events or chaotic kind of um, lifestyles is memory. So children will need reminding because they're using most of their functioning to survive. So they're going to need reminding about things that you think are really clear that you've explained or that this always happens on a Wednesday. So if you've got children like that who who just seem to not remember those things, then, you know, it's worth just noting they're not doing it on, on purpose. Worth just noting there may be something else going on and just useful to have your visual clues um, just to make it easier for them. And they can then help to predict what's coming. Uh, so also thinking about um, any benefits from particular behaviours. So is there a gain to the child from doing this? So is it something they can help? Are they choosing to do this behaviour because of what they get from it? So trying to just check that out. Um, and then if there is a need, often that's a need for more um, attention. Um, so we wouldn't call it attention seeking, we'd call it attachment seeking. It's a need for connection and relationship. So that's also telling you something about what that child needs and what they're not getting from their caregivers. So it's trying to avoid being punitive in that instance, but um, be supportive and think about what you can put in place. Um, so safe places, so um, all children need safe places, so whether that's a particular part of the setting or whether it's just a little zone within the setting or a little setup or a particular object that they can go and get or go and look at um, that makes them feel safe and, uh, you know, recalibrate and relaxed and that's really helpful. And having a plan, so having a, a plan for a child um, you know, either because you've noticed that they seem unsettled and they seem anxious or because the family's actually told you about something that's going on, then it would be really sensible. And I know that you do this to have a plan um, and to note any particular triggers for that specific child. So the examples here are physical contact. So not all children feel reassured by a cuddle. Um, so because of other touch they may have had in their lives. So loud noises or bright lights or lots of people or unexpected bells, things like that. So um, just noting what they are and either preparing the child for those or giving them a, a little strategy of something they can do when they when that's have going to happen, like having a little object um, that's uh, calming for them or reassuring. And then anticipating anything that's going to be difficult. So in the case of bereavement, if you know that there's a significant anniversary coming up, then it's kind of preparing for that and just being watchful. So you don't want to make a big deal of it with a child by talking about it, but it's just knowing about it, having it in that plan and thinking about any specific particular circumstances, anybody that will be helpful to involve around that time. Um, and thinking about how you might explain any changes or any differences in how you're treating that child to other children. So just being really aware of those things. So how do we kind of meet all these different needs? So um, we're not just thinking about trauma here. And when I'm talking about trauma, I don't want to sort of say that all children in your settings have experienced a huge amount of trauma. We know that there, there are lots of families with lots of issues going on, but what I'm really alluding to is this whole um, community trauma that everybody has experienced um, through the pandemic. It's, it's affected everybody. And so nobody is immune from this. There will be some people who we know um, are preferring the more isolated lifestyle that some of us have had to live. Um, and some people have really preferred that and they've preferred being at home with less um, people contact and um, other people have really struggled with it. And, and families have been, you know, separated from each other and friends. So I'm just um, putting it in here because I think it's 
it's relevant and we're still living it. So even though we're hopeful of a lifting of restrictions and life becoming a bit more free again, we're still in it and um, we're still dealing with it. And certainly I send services are not quite back to how they were. So um, that's why I've included it really just as something to um, touch on now. So um, the four things that are really important um, in relating um, to children with, with any additional needs, whether it's trauma or additional needs, special educational needs, are these attunement, empathy, containment and emotional regulation. And I've just put in these two little videos here. So the first one that is really more suitable for older children and, and adults as well is the Brene Brown talking about what empathy is and the difference between empathy and sympathy, which is a nice uh, video. And the, the bottom one is um, a Sesame Street video and talking about um, empathy in Sesame Street style for primary and younger children. So it's a nice fun one to use with children uh, uh, when you get the opportunity. So the key relational needs, so attunement, affect attunement is is really tuning in to what that child's needs are so um, just picking up on any verbal and non-verbal cues about how they might be feeling and really engaging with them in the same way in the same kind of energy levels so if you see they're a little bit kind of quiet and subdued looking you wouldn't perhaps go in with a massive smile and really bouncing in because it's kind of out of sync with where they're at so you'd approach them quietly and gently and just use their name and just talk about oh you're looking a bit quiet today you know and just trying to encourage them to kind of come out a little bit um, in a gentle way and the way that you use your voice that's called prosody so the tone of your voice the volume and the language that you use so clearly you're all early years staff so you will be very um expert in in picking the right language to uh, relate to uh, young children but just talking very simply in in words that your, your your age group is going to relate to and how you um express your your face and how you hold yourself how you get alongside the child down on their level all of those things show that you're tuning in and you're really interested in them and attending to how are they doing how can you support them? And that's going to help a child to relax and just feel better. Even if they're little and not able to articulate and speak to you about it, you're going to help them to relax um, into, into that kind of uh, interaction with you. So empathy is hugely important. So we know that we've all, we all experience life in different ways and children have um so where i've got cyp on some of these slides uh forgive me it's children and young people so it's my shorthand um so how a child experiences something is going to be perhaps very different to how you might experience it you might think what are you worrying about you know you've been down you've been down the corridor into this area lots of times with everybody why is it so scary today um, but, but, you know, there's something going on. So it's, sometimes it's, it's hard for us to be patient, but it's just thinking about how you get to what is going on, finding ways to help that child name the feeling, as we talked about earlier, and not trying to make them feel something different because a feeling is a feeling and that's what needs to be acknowledged. So helping them to make sense. Oh, so... Ah, it must be so difficult to come in here when you haven't been to this place for a few weeks or because you're in a different place um, during the day now or because you've, you're sitting with some new children. Oh, I'm wondering if that's feeling a little bit scary. So so just voicing it and wondering with the child, um, you know, might might help even if they can't articulate verbally, they can understand your uh, sentiment and containment so what's containing for children is the structure order predictability routines as we said being consistent um, having some limits 
staying so so for those older children who might tell you something or talk to you it's staying with the child's feelings without telling your story about when something similar happened to you so staying there and allowing them to be upset and painful not trying to rescue them um, and of course physical containment if necessary and soothing is what we mean by emotional regulation so helping a child to calm down comforting them helping them to find ways to comfort themselves and being outdoors is is a really recommended strategy uh, fresh air or cold water on the face can can help to shift a stuck emotional state so um, those things are are really helpful so how can we put it into practice well there's pace which is dan hughes there's p and the three r's and then there's wine which is I wonder, I imagine, I notice, and that's how you demonstrate empathy. So we're just going to have a very brief look at this. Um, so being playful, accepting, it's I'm sorry that you're feeling angry. However, it's not OK to hit little Johnny. So being clear <clears throat> about what the limits are whilst being empathetic and being curious. Um, and I think this this bottom statement about children don't want to be fixed, they want to be heard. I think that applies to all of us. Um, you know, we need to we need to be able to air whatever the issue is before um, we can help start to move towards a way of feeling better about it. It's, it would be presumptuous for people to fix everything. So this goes back to the importance of feeling safe in, in school or in the nursery or any setting, ensuring that everybody feels physically and emotionally safe. Um, staff wellbeing policy and practice is for larger settings, really, but um, that would be um, a good thing to have. Um, and I can certainly send you some templates if that's of interest. Relating is, again, about relating to all the people in your community and actually thinking about everyone's needs and how can you enhance the experience of being in the setting for everyone in it. Um, regulating again, calm bodies, minds and brains, um, enabling people to have breaks, lower the stress levels, and then reasoning and reflecting is making sense. So teaching children how to manage themselves and how to um, calm themselves down. So Dr. Bruce Perry has, uh, he's um, a very famous neuroscientist and he's written widely on the subject of attachment and trauma. And this is his neurosequential model, which goes from the bottom up. So from the, at the bottom, you really need to be, so when a child is angry or upset or in a heightened state, we have to help them to calm down first. That's the absolute first thing we need to do because we can't ask them questions or expect them to tell us what's going on when they're in that state. So then we need to relate to them and then we need to have the conversation about what's going on, uh, what's, what is needed and how can we learn from this and what will we do next time if a similar thing happens. So this is just building on that. So it's just thinking about um, all the factors around the child and all the interventions. So again, from the bottom up, sort of working with the brain, uh, different types of interventions um, and everybody working together. So parents and carers, um, earlier setting staff and a wider network and any more specialist support that might be needed. So that's just a model. I'm going to whip on. Uh, so yeah, this is more just tips really. So acknowledging children's reactions, um, using stories wherever possible, finding out what, what's underlying the difficulties. Uh, we've talked about our use of our body and our face and our voice. It's often uh, not the child's fault that they um, feel upset. There, there may be something going on behind. Um, and try to encourage children to think about other times when they felt anxious or frightened or worried <clears throat> and actually they dealt with it and it turned out to be less bad than they thought. So using those comparisons is often really helpful. Um, and self-care is um, good for staff and adults around those children. 
So just looking at some of the ways to help children to self-regulate is expressing their emotions. So whether that's through drawing, and you'll be doing this um, just throughout your curriculum on your care. So writing things down, using sand to um, express. So sometimes things that come out in the sand are representative of what's going on in a child's um, background or hoping for in the future. And sometimes we can do things uh, with, with creative methods that um, really express so much more that little children can't put into words. So um, using that sort of play is very helpful. Having countdown calendars for any type of change that's coming up, using feelings trees, so writing feelings on leaves and hanging them on a tree, weather charts, having the photo of the child and every morning when they come in, putting their photo on the, the sun or on the thunder or the clouds uh, to indicate how they might be feeling or using faces. So just talk, developing that sort of emotional vocabulary with um, children, really helpful. And there's a link here to another Sesame Street uh, worksheet, which is uh, encouraging children to think about their favourite place or their happy place and to um, you can write it in on a worksheet with Big Bird and then it's encouraging children to think about visualize their happy place when they're feeling upset um, so it's a way of just encouraging them to be able to distance themselves and, and use a technique uh, and then well-being boxes so um, all sorts of different things you can put in there you could have these available in your settings um, to use uh, in a group or individually. You can set times of day when you get these things out, have a look at them, talk through them, look at some books, um, just use those creative things, blow bubbles, practice breathing. So, um, and there's a link here to some library resources as well, which are really useful. Um, so also developing uh, relationship building skills. So for older children, you might like to do uh, a classroom contract. So that's involving all the children in thinking about how do they want their class to run? Um, so there's some examples here. You can use these in circle time. It's actually um, something I've been reading about lately called collaborative decision making <clears throat> in schools where you actually invite children's opinions. It's a way of getting people voice, um, but it's also a way of getting children to own some of the behaviours that they would like um, in their class. So um, what rights do they have? How are they going to um, treat each other? What are the most important things? So you could you just have up to five things perhaps um, and just use those as a way of reminding them these are the these are the kind of conditions that you've set that you wanted to have in in this setting so if they're too difficult what why is that what do we need to do about that what should happen if someone keeps uh contravening those um conditions that we've agreed to so it gives children the opportunity to practice working in groups thinking about decisions that are going to affect other people um, as well as themselves and, and cooperation. So those are nice things to do to and develop safe environments. Um, and then also communication and conflict resolution skills are hugely important because what I'm hearing a lot at the moment is, is that children are falling out with each other. There's lots of friendship issues. <clears throat> um, so having um, just time dedicated to talking about this, having discussions about what are good communication and listening skills. What's it like when somebody's not listening to you? How do you know? Um, how can you develop better listening skills um, with each other? And how can you help children to really talk about what things are hard and what things are easy? And how can they help each other with those things? So another idea is to have solution cards. So when you ask children to think about what are the things they find difficult? Um, and they could have some little solutions or ideas. Well, what I could do is call out for help or I could say, oh, I'm really sorry, or I could just walk away if it's too difficult. But having little cards to remind children of those things, because in the moment, sometimes we, we all forget 
those those good strategies and thinking about pros and cons um so working out the best solution so you're encouraging them those problem solving skills and actually that all is not lost if it doesn't work we can try something else so thinking about those things um with children really helpful so um, there's just a few links here, which I won't go through now, but um, these have been written. Um, I think they're from America, the first two, and there's some aimed at really young children and some aimed at older preschool children. And just the impact and, and the questions that some children might ask and, and some scripted um, conversation prompts and some template answers. So these are written after sort of earthquakes and natural disasters, but some of the things uh, like children feeling unsafe and, and asking questions about that um, apply to our situation now in the pandemic as well. And then the, the whole class happy pack has got some lovely um, activities. There's a little poster you could print out, a little aid memoir, with just some things to help children to recalibrate and to do star jumps or have quiet time or different things that you can do just to help yourself to feel better. Um, and then there's a little video about, um, I love Sesame Street, as you might have noticed, and um, the puppets just talking about uh, how to manage difficult feelings. So um, that's worth having a look at as well. So I'm just going to hand over to Katie for a moment to talk about um, smooth transitions as well um, before we break. Thanks, Katie. Hi, thanks, Judy. Um, so yes, we're going to take um, a quick look at well-being being at the forefront of transition to school. Um, so before I go over some of our updated guidance that we've put on CZone for the transition to school, I just wanted to talk about some of the key messages that we that hopefully underpin that guidance with you today. Um, so as I'm sure you're already aware, now more than ever, well-being um, is vital um, for the transition to school because of the year that we've had. Um, so PSED and well-being has always been important for transition, um, but now more than ever, uh, and because of some of the reasons that Judy was discussing, so um, the past year, it's been a year and a few months now, by the time children go on to school in September, it'll be a year and a half, and that's such a long time for especially children, when you think that's maybe, you know, almost half of their lives that they've spent in a pandemic. Um, so it's just really being um, conscious of that um, when we're supporting them to then, you know, for a big change, it's difficult enough as it is, but doing it under these circumstances, it could be even more difficult. Um, so really just, I think we we're fantastic at this in early years anyway, but really listening to the child's voice and, and the child being at the heart of transition. And the child's voice, that doesn't have to mean, you know, what they're saying, but as Judy was saying, they might be showing you through their behaviour that something's not quite all right. So they might be distressed or angry or upset or, you know, those withdrawn children as well that often go missed because they're not saying how they feel and they can just be um, seen as quiet children, but actually they're struggling inside. So really listening to the child's voice throughout transition um, and giving children plenty of time um, to establish their routines and their relationships, so not rushing them through this transition. And again, I think we're brilliant in, at this in early years because we really think about the transition throughout the whole year leading up to them moving on to school. And even after they've moved to school as well, it's good to catch up with teachers if you've got those relationships and vice versa, teachers with settings and childminders. Um, and just communicating after they've transitioned as well to kind of wrap everything up and, you know, tie any loose ends. Um, so really thinking about the circumstances that children have been in over the past year in the pandemic and, and what effect this might have had on their development. So, you know, have they spent long periods of time away from the setting? Um, have they, you know, when the pandemic first started last year, some children were moved around settings, weren't they, because their setting might have closed um, because of COVID or they couldn't stay open. So thinking about children that have had maybe more transitions than usual, um, thinking about what's going on at home. Um, we know that this pandemic has put a huge amount of pressure on some families. Like Judy was saying, some families have 
coped quite well with it. They've quite enjoyed that more isolated life. Um, other families that might have been a catalyst for, you know, losing jobs, breakdowns in relationships and that kind of thing. So just really being wary of that. And then communication as well. So communicate with each other. Schools want to hear from settings uh, and settings want to hear from the schools as well. So, you know, now's a good time to start thinking about visits, if possible. That can be done outside, you know, if you don't want visitors inside the setting or even if it has to be done virtually. Um, so at, at the very least, you know, having phone calls or, or Teams meetings, Zoom meetings to just communicate with each other and pass on that really important information that sometimes you can't always say in front of the parents. You know, sometimes you might need to have that conversation between just the two of you. But obviously involving the parents is really important as well. Um, so just going um, over quickly, you should all be aware that we've updated our summative assessment moving on document um, and also we have some guidance on supporting the transition to school during a pandemic. So both those documents have been updated and they're on C zone under transition to school. You should have received those already because um, we did email those out. Um, but they're there if you haven't received that for any reason. Um, the one, the only change we've made to the summative assessment moving on form is well, we've changed the date, so it's 2021, but also we have just added a box that says information relevant to COVID. So all of the things that I've just discussed about, you know, if that child has been away from the setting for long periods of time or um, they, they're they struggling emotionally because of the pandemic, that would be relevant information that you could put in that box on the front page. You don't have to use that box. It's just there if you do need it for, the, for a particular child. Um, and then the pandemic guidance, that's got a lot, that's for schools, um, childminders, nurseries and for parents as well. Um, and that's just got ideas of um, how to support the pandemic, uh, how to support the transition during a pandemic. So the point, the bullet points that you can see on the screen, hopefully underpin um, that document. So it's really, you know, thinking about well-being, emotional well-being, mental health and that personal, social and emotional development. Um, and that's it really and just to say as well you know it's the second transition to school that we're doing under you know in a pandemic and just use what worked well last time as well because um, I think that's what we're good at in early as we're really creative and imaginative with it as well thanks Judy great thank you so I was going to come out at this stage and just see if there were any questions um can I do that Sorry, yeah, there, there's no questions on the chat, but okay. some people might have a question. Okay, just so, so that's sort of a bit of a whistle stop tour through um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, supporting children's um, emotional well-being and some of the things that you can do. And um, obviously you're doing them um, because you're working in the field and you've been doing them throughout the pandemic. So. Um, you know, if anything, if nothing else, um, hopefully there's some reminders there of things, um, useful things to do. OK, so I'll go back behind the slides, <laughs> do my disappearing act again. Um, and boom. Yeah, so I thought here would be a chance for some audience participation. So I was looking at um, various reports and surveys um, in thinking about early years. And I, I came across, I think this is from um, the Heads Together State of the Nation report. So I thought it'd be interesting to ask what you thought. So I, in the left hand side, there are some percentages. And so if you'd like to put in the chat and perhaps you can just tell me, Katie, what, what percentage of parents or carers of not to five year olds believe that they are largely responsible for children's health and happiness? What percentage would you say? I think everyone's scared to go first. Oh, there's no, doesn't matter. Oh, no. We're not They're going to check through, anybody. Yeah. So 90 and 70 percent we've got. Yeah, OK. So 80%. I would have thought this. Yeah, 
80 percent so 90 70 80 so they're quite high percentages aren't mm -hmm. they i would have thought this would be um quite high as well um but it's 58 percent 58 percent of parents and carers think that they are largely responsible so it's not as high as i imagined it would be mm -hmm. so what percentage do you think of parents and carers feel that schools and parents should have equal responsibility for social skills and behaviours? I'll give you a moment to think about that. So this is social skills and behaviours first. Ninety percent or more. Seventy-five yeah. percent. Mm. So again, quite high percentages. Yeah. And I would, yeah, okay. So I would have thought that too. And it's forty-nine percent. So one in two parents, roughly, feel that schools and parents should both have equal responsibility for social skills and behaviours. Mm. Um. So what do you think about the next one? What percentage believe that schools and parents should have equal responsibility for children and young people's emotional awareness? Do you think that's going to be different? So we've got 60%, 55, some more 60. Okay, 3%, so mm -hmm. again, quite low, quite low, so number having equal responsibility for emotional awareness. And then what percentage do you think believes that parents, so the percentage of parents believe that parents should be mainly responsible for that, for emotional awareness in children? I think that's going to be higher or lower. So thirty percent. Mm. Um, yeah, Alice said based on the on the rest, sixty percent. We've got fifty percent as well. Yeah, so it's quite variable. So it's actually fifty four percent. So they're quite low percentages, really, aren't they, all round? Um, yes, and there was some kind of thinking around this that perhaps um, parents and carers, perhaps when, they're, when their children are little, they kind of are more inclined to think that their health and happiness depends on them, on the family, um, and input from the parents and carers and then once children go to school there's more of a, an expectation that the setting will um, provide most of this input so it's quite interesting that and then you might know this one um, what the percentage was of children who were not considered school ready in 2018 to 19 and that's looking at their skills in language com communication and literacy so given you, I've given you a bit of clue there. <laughs> but, um, so what percentage of children were not school ready in 2018 to 19? So that's before the pandemic, isn't it? 35, 45. Mm. OK. 40, another 40. OK, so it's actually not as bad as you thought. <laughs> so um, it's 28 percent, but that's still one in four, isn't it? Or a quarter, over a quarter of children were not considered school ready. So it meant their language, communication and literacy skills were not at the expected level. And in some deprived areas of the UK, that was a, that was as many as 42 percent. So those of you who said um, the higher figures, maybe you are in more deprived areas of the county. So, um, you know, it's just, I just thought it was interesting to think, well, what are the attitudes? What, who is responsible for the mental health and emotional well-being of our children? And actually, 
I very much believe that, you know, most of this is is um, established very early on. And we know that attachment patterns are are kind of largely set within the first three years. So so the family background is really key and the kind of that emotional connection and relationship is really obviously very key. But all of the stuff that you're doing in your settings has a huge part to play as well. So we're going to sort of look at um, a bit further some of these um, figures. So this is public attitudes to early years. So this is the same report. So 98% of people believe that nurture is essential to lifelong outcomes. So that's um, nurture as opposed to nature. So that's obviously thinking that the input from adults around children, whoever they are, is really, really, you know, essential. But yet 24% say that the start of pregnancy to five years is the most important. So that's a very small percentage to think about that. And then 90% of people see parental mental health and emotional well-being as critical to the child's development. So the state of the parents or carers' emotional well-being, 90%, but only 10% of parents and carers have taken time during the period of this survey, which was a couple of years ago. And I think they surveyed, I think it was about 3,000 parents and carers. Um, only 10%, despite thinking this is important, only 10% uh, ended to their own well-being. 70% of parents say they feel judged by other parents. And 48% say this has taken an emotional toll on them. And the pandemic has pushed up parental loneliness from 38% to 63%. So that's huge jump. 13% of parents in the most deprived areas say they often or always feel lonely. 13%, so sort of one in 10. Um, and only 5% in the least deprived areas. So in the more affluent areas, that's not such a big issue. Um, 40% feel that community support has grown in the last few years. Um, and who is receiving that community support? So 33% in the most deprived areas, so less than the 40%, and 52% feel that there's more community support in the more affluent areas. So, so just curious figures, these. So is it because, and we don't know, obviously, all the data behind these numbers, but is it because people in more affluent areas have more transport need, needs met, they don't have to rely on public transport, um, they've just got more um, backing altogether, they're more able to engage with support that's out there, or they have better help-seeking behaviours, perhaps. Um, but anyway, it's clear from just these, um, I've just selected a few headline um, figures that I thought were interesting, and it's clear from these that um, parents and carers, uh, they are critical and they do believe that they, they have a critical role in their children's well-being, but actually their own well-being is compromised for a whole set of different reasons. And so we're just going to look at some of the things to, to encourage so there is a link here um, to young minds of um, young minds obviously is aimed at older children, uh, more the adolescent age range, but they've developed some really good resources for parents and carers. And so, again, I would say that some of these would still be useful um, to signpost your parents and carers to because they're just conversation starters or things to think about. They have a parent helpline um, and they write articles and have lots of information about various aspects of well-being. So it it's might, might be worth a look. Um, but clearly, children's well-being is directly related to parents' well-being. So what can you encourage your parents and carers to do? So sharing worries. So I think that whole thing about we're not in this alone, you know, we're not human beings on our own. We're not islands. Actually, the more we're able to talk about how we feel, our stresses and seek support, and the more that we destigmatize that, the better everybody is going to feel. So seeking support from your own personal networks in the in the in the um, first 
as a first port of call and then perhaps thinking about any organisations that might be able to offer further support is a really good idea. Sleep, diet and exercise, those are really basic ingredients of well-being. I'm sure that we'd all agree if you don't get enough sleep, if your sleep's disturbed for a length of time over a period, if any of you have had babies and young children who didn't sleep, um, you know, I'm sure lots of us would, would remember feeling like a zombie for a few years. And it does affect your well-being. It affects your resilience levels. It affects your staying power, your concentration, your temperament, your uh, ability to cope with things. So, um, so that's a basic sleep. And sometimes we can't do much about that if we're in a situation uh, with young children who don't sleep. But, but eating well, getting a break every now and again, having some downtime, getting some exercise. Those are key ingredients that we all need to just work on all the time. Um, and staying in touch, thinking about learning about what's going on for children, what children are struggling with so that parents can be attuned to their needs and be able to talk about those things. So pocket money opportunities might apply to older children. I'm not quite sure anymore what age pocket money starts at, um, but, you know, encouraging good habits around money uh, and understanding of money at a young age is going to be useful. Um, avoiding adverts for consumer goods, that's um, to avoid this kind of I want mentality. And if parents and carers are in situations where they're unable to really um, offer uh, financial material things and they don't want to get um, drawn into difficult situations where the children want things they can't provide them then avoid the opportunity from happening you know that adults are in control of these things um, and helping parents and carers to uh, understand their own stresses where to get help if they can't find it within their own circles um, and trying to engage them in in the life of your setting if that's possible are there any opportunities do you have friends of your setting do you need volunteers who can help you to do things um, some parents and carers you know would welcome opportunities like that so um, just worth finding out and seeing if anyone can help you with those things so this, I've left this slide in, even though it's more kind of schools focused, um, but just some uh, links here as well. So Marvellous Me, another way of engaging parents and carers is to tell them how well their child is doing. And I know that um, this is a little um, programme where you can send, uh, I think it's emojis, um, home to parents and carers, very easy to communicate. Uh, through mobiles, but also sending postcards home to parents and carers about the progress of their child. Um, you know, for some parents and carers who might not get anything nice in the post very often, that's like a little ray of sunshine through the door. So um, just thinking about little things like that that you can do. And there's some guidance here on um, talking to children whose parents have mental health um, difficulties as well. Um, and some considerations, so that might be um, useful to you. Um, and a parent carer survey, if you wanted to find out how your parents felt about what you're doing in your setting around emotional well-being or, you know, whether they knew what was happening or wanted some feedback, there's some um, suggested um, uh, some questions there and some further resources from mentally healthy schools. Um, so I'm going to whiz through these because I'm conscious of time. Um, so just these are places where parents and carers can also find out information about any issues or additional needs or support needs that their children might have. So you may have parents and carers in your settings who have older children as well. So some of these are tips for parents to help them to manage some of those additional needs of their children. Um, but some of it's also just information and the Parent and Carer Forum in East Sussex is for uh, parents of children with additional needs um, and that's a, a membership organisation and ISEND um, is working quite closely with them on specific issues around SEND. So it's a chance for parents and carers to get involved and get some support from peers as well with similar experiences. And Family Lives also is another uh, parent and carer helpline it's 24 7 you can ring up about absolutely anything uh, that is you're finding difficult in your family and talk to a trained volunteer 
um, and just get a little bit of support. So um, those are all really useful uh, things. Also, parents and carers well-being. In East Sussex, we have the Staying Well service, which is run by South Down Housing. Um, you just need to be over 16 um, and it's a way of um, staying in touch with other people who might have poor mental health or, you know, might need some ongoing support to maintain good well-being. And that's there. So you can signpost people to that. And also the other one is Health in Mind, which is so these are free services. And this one also takes referrals from uh, 17 and a half year old young people. So you can refer yourself online or you can be referred through your GP. You've got lots of resources. They have groups that are running virtually at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's they, they work on a cognitive behaviour therapy base. So um, that's that's a, a very worthwhile service. So um, I'm just going to pop out briefly and see if there are any questions about parents and carers. Or oh, any issues that are coming up for people in settings. We just have Carol's um, comment in, in the comment box just about having more discussions with families around emotional wellbeing. Mm. Um, which I completely agree with as well, I think. And especially parents can sometimes really get caught up in other elements of the curriculum, like mathematics and literacy, and can my child write their name now? Uh, and, and all those kinds of things, but actually really going back to um, personal, social and emotional development, because children won't learn anything if, if they're not happy and confident and have good self-esteem. Mm. Okay, yeah. So... Yeah, and someone else saying, yeah, I will be sending out the slides and um, yeah, so that you'll have all the links and families with SEND, yeah, particularly struggling at the moment. Absolutely. And, and anything where, you know, children don't have their usual access to other support that they've been used to having. Or, or if the support is not available in person, but it all has to be done online or through the telephone, you know, that just doesn't work for some children or some, some adults. So, um, you know, that means there's no support in that in that instance. So it's, it's really difficult. And so parents and carers who've perhaps been, um, been lucky enough to have additional support for their children's needs are perhaps being asked to do more and being asked to kind of, um, you know, input in a way that they haven't had to do on their own previously. So it's really difficult. So parents and carers are, I know, needing a lot of support. Um, and that's really challenging for settings when, you know, you've already got your work cut out. So it is really difficult. And I think it's just keeping emotional well-being on the agenda and just being human and just asking people how they are. And, um, you know, is there anything that's difficult and what would help? Not taking it on, not taking responsibility for sorting that out, but actually having conversations with parents and carers about what are their options? What do they feel would would help? And what are their options for getting that help? And then signposting wherever possible because you can't take it all on. And, and you don't want to kind of encourage any sort of codependency either on the setting for the setting to be the one that's doing everything. So it's just kind of being mindful of where the limits are for you and your colleagues in in the workplace as well. OK, so I'm going to just dive back in. Um, here we go. I'm going to talk about staff wellbeing um, and this is really ongoing as well. As I was saying, we, we all have to work at this and sometimes it's easy and, and we can do all the things we know are good for our wellbeing without even thinking about them. And other times they demand a lot more effort from us. So what I would say about that is that it's it's habits, it's getting into habits and it's fake it till you make it. Do things even if you don't feel like doing them because you know from your life experience that it's going to be worth it. So um, managing staff wellbeing in the settings. So we do have a link here to um, 
uh, a toolkit. So there is a staff wellbeing toolkit which was written um, with the pandemic in mind. It's been up there on co on um, CZM for about a year now, so I'm probably going to do a really big update to everything soon. But um, there is a toolkit there and there are some um, plans in there that you can use well-being plans so but it's actually I think staff well-being always needs to be prioritized because if you're not okay as staff how can you um you know uh, what's the word how can you give um a very supportive um safe containing environment to others so the friends and family you know calling on support making sure that you have social time, time when you're not working. So I think many of us in working with children and families have worked a lot harder and a lot more and a lot longer during the pandemic. And so what I'm aware of is that lots of people are feeling like they're running out of steam now. This has been going on for a long time. Um, so making time for yourself. And I know that's easier said than done. And we can often prioritise other people's needs, but we do that at a cost. So wellbeing plans, I'm going to, I might show you in a minute if we have time. Um, but a wellbeing plan is just really thinking about what do you need to keep yourself feeling OK? So how do you know when you're functioning well? And what would you notice um, about yourself if your wellbeing started to dip? So it might be, for example, that your your sleep is not so good and you wake up in the night or you can't get to sleep. It might be that you lose interest in food, you lose your appetite. That never happens to me. I always go the other way. So if I'm feeling stressed, I just eat more. Um, but so that's a sign for me that I'm, um, you know, that's not quite right. Um, and sometimes you can find that your energy drops and you don't feel like being with people and start to withdraw. So the same signs that we looked at at the beginning of these slides um, that we might notice in children withdrawing, uh, we probably wouldn't regress in the same way, but being irritable, uh, being tearful, um, not doing things that we know are good for us. So all those things and sometimes using alcohol more. Um, or turning to sugar, things like that. Um, they they give you a short term hit, but they are not helpful in the long run. So just thinking about yourself um, and in your settings, obviously it depends on the makeup of your setting, whether you have colleagues, staff and departments, whether you have a kind of wellbeing or mental health lead or a SENCO. Um, I know lots of settings have offered open door drop ins where they've had a set time of the week where staff could just drop in and have a chat or talk about something specific. Keeping in touch with people and feeling connected, I think, is really important through the, through this period. Um, so I know that staff rooms where people have them have been, you know, that the staff room has gone, hasn't it? Or it's changed completely. So now there isn't one staff room where everyone hangs out. It's kind of segregation and little isolated staff rooms and so people are still working in bubbles people might not be in bubbles with people they particularly would have got on with um, but having regular catch-ups online uh, when possible uh, really great I know that lots of people have whatsapp groups as well where you can just keep in touch and um, check in on each other so all of those things are really valuable taking breaks moving your body so i'm spending a lot of time at my computer i have to remember to get up and go away and uh, have a walk here and there um having coffee breaks having a buddy system so so many of you may be working in very small teams or even on your own if you're a childminder um so you're you're just with children all day with very little opportunity for adult interaction. So for you, this is really important to have regular connection time with other people. Um, so if that's not your family members or if you're living on your own, even more important, setting up buddy systems. So if you haven't got colleagues in your own setting, can you, and you may have done this already, but having networks where even if it's just one or two other people, you just have a regular slot and you catch up with each other and you have a moan or you just talk about how things are going. Giving yourself permission to have a moan is also very useful um, because we've only got so much capacity and we've all got different capacity levels. So um, 
of us have got, you know, really big capacity for stress and lots of things, and others of us, you know, have not. And so we need to be aware of or where our levels are, what our limits are, and when we're starting to reach them. And actually just to by building in regular contact time and regular breaks, all of these things, um, we stop those levels from becoming too high. So just prioritising maybe three things to do. So this is something I started to do because I was a great one for multitasking and then getting to the end of the day and think, what have I actually done? So I actually have a hit list now of three things and I focus in on those three things. And there might be lots of other things going along alongside, but just sometimes less is more. So um, and to feel that you've achieved something is very helpful for your well-being as well. Um, and sometimes just starting something, we can easily feel overwhelmed when there are so many demands on us and so many different agendas. Things are changing all the time. Regulations, legislation, um, COVID guidance, staff, families, things happening in our own lives. All There's lots of change all the time. And so we have to just try and keep things constant. So the same as for the children, those establishing those routines, then we can look forward to them. And then you get some kind of reward from, um, you know, at points during your week. Um, and thinking about when you have your best energy. And so not trying to uh, do something significant when you know that you're tired, you know. And this is great advice. We don't always follow this advice, but these are just things to remember, really. Um, so just to sort of um, think about trying to prevent burnout, really. So there are many, many um, schools of thought, but there is um, a definition of burnout and it is related to chronic work related stress generally. And that is a definition from the World Health Organization. So that's when we become depleted and exhausted. So we want to avoid that happening. So um, when resilience fails, it often happens at a cognitive level. We, um, through multitasking and overworking or overusing certain parts of ourselves and underusing others, like maybe under exercising or under socialising, but overworking, then um, that can lead to decision fatigue. We can just find ourselves unable to think straight. Uh, and that's because we got flooded as well with cortisol. That's our brain shutting down and telling us you can't keep going like this. And so we need to take take heed of that. So, um, you know, that can happen in organisations and in teams, but actually teams are made up of individuals. So individuals this is where we need to take care of ourselves because we are responsible for our own personal selves at the end of the day. Um, and the employer can only do so much. So we need to just pay attention to those symptoms that we notice in ourselves about when we're becoming withdrawn or disengaged and when our energy is dropping. And we need to do something about that and take a break or we need to uh, not take on something extra or we need to delay doing something. So just things to look out for. Um, and also, um, just again, really just more of the same sort of thinking about how we develop techniques for managing stress. So whether that's like for the children, whether that's we do that through regular controlled breathing or we do regular exercise or you learn a new skill. So you apply your cognitive functions to something enjoyable that gives you, takes you completely away, takes all of your focus and then you can't think about work, for example. So it's engaging you psychologically. Um, so those are things that we need. We need to find meaning in our lives. We need to find personal satisfaction. So having a workplace where you have colleagues and you can talk about this and, and you can. So routine work is important. Um, most of us are in this these roles because we love the work that we do and we love working with children and families. But sometimes we need a little bit extra as well. Sometimes we need challenge. Sometimes we need to do something a little bit different just to keep us fresh and to keep ourselves learning. So it's just thinking about all those different things and how we can build them into the workplace. So 
um, you can see that the state of overload that if an organization kind of carries on operating like that with individuals who are disengaged, um, tired, um, inattentive, indifferent, losing interest, then the organization fails and actually the people don't do very well either. So it's just worth thinking about all of those things and how we can really maximize opportunities for coming together for engaging, sometimes doing um, like a, a strengths or skills audit in your organization can be useful as well within your staff just to just to try and optimize the opportunities for every individual playing to their strengths. Um, and that can be really just um, you know a great way to have a sense of achievement. So um, thinking about how people can really be boosted in the workplace is, is helpful. Uh, so yeah, um, that's from just being there. And so yeah, going back to self-care, it's really going from the top down. So simplifying your working life and, and perhaps your personal life as well. So if you are feeling overwhelmed, it's thinking about what can you not do? What can you delegate or pass on to someone else? What can you um, extricate yourself from? What can you focus on? So if you're feeling overwhelmed, the key really is to focus in on something, maybe one thing. So, um, and, and that's what I mean about the three things a day. So three things a day when in the, in the sort of tum tumult of what's going on in the settings and with children and families is uh, sometimes what you need is just to focus in. And if you get more done, fantastic. Um, but just thinking about this process, so starting to notice, being self-aware, noticing what's going on for you, seeking help, from your colleagues or from your wider network. Um, it's great that you've got these early years hubs because that's a great resource for you to support each other. Um, and then seeking outside help if you need to. So there are lots of links here as well to uh, support staff, mental health and wellbeing. Um, there's some wellbeing plans that you can think about. Um, so that, again, they ask questions like, you know, what would your colleagues notice or what would you notice about a colleague if their wellbeing was dipping and what might you want from them? Um, so just having those discussions, uh, maybe even with a manager if you if you have one. But perhaps if you are working on your own, might be useful just maybe not even you could fill in a plan on your own um, but even just to talk about what are the sources of help um, if you felt that you needed them so I'm going to share some uh, here as well so I'm just coming to the end now so these are just some slides on lots of resources really so these are just some books and resources for uh, supporting feelings work with children uh, there is the Sussex, uh, East Sussex Schools Mental Health Guide, which is designed for schools. Um, but again, the same processes, the same thinking, really. Um, it's about a way of being with children and adults. Um, and, and these offer some tips, but you will know best how to apply those to your particular age range. Um, and some references here, which are very COVID uh, related. Um, about helping with emotions um, and working digitally as well. Um, more references for staff, parents and carers and children. These are more for older children, um, but just more references, so many of them. And these are support services for early years settings. And just one last thing to tell you about, which is uh, we're having our mental health conference for schools and colleges and early years sittings will be able to access these. It's all going to be virtual again uh, for the second year running. And we're doing it this time over three consecutive days. I will send out a, a, a flyer um, so you can just save the dates um, and they're going to be four, four virtual events on each of those three days with the theme being togetherness. And we'll be looking at some of the themes that have been coming up for settings around isolation and um, identity and diversity, particularly. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we have Louise Bomber 
going to do a session and she's written lots of books on attachment and uh, developing secure relationships with children. Um, and Hope Virgo, who is going to share her lived experience of eating disorders, um, because we know that eating disorders have gone up four fourfold um, during the pandemic. Um, so we're going to have a focus on that too. So um, I will send out the booking information um, as soon as I can. So, one minute to go. <laughs> so yes, just um, I hope that's been useful, but I'm happy to take any questions if people have any. But we can always um, follow up afterwards. If people think of something afterwards, um, I'm happy to respond by email. Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. And I, I didn't know, Faye, if you needed to say anything before yeah, we thank finish. You, thank you very much. It's really, um, it was really nice to see it from the different perspectives as well, how to support staff, which is so easily and often um, forgotten really in, in settings and in schools. So thank you very much. It was really useful and it was there's so there's so much information there to look through as well. So thank you. Um, if I haven't got there, are a couple of people that you're not signed on as the name you so if you if you're here and you're you're, you're not, not on as your setting I'm not sure where you've come from if that makes sense so just make sure you email and say could I have the slides and I'll make sure they come out to you at, um, as and when as well but thank you very much Judy and thank you Katie for your um, input as well welcome thank you all for coming and for your attention and I wish you well with the ongoing mm -hmm.